This is a Nightline Friday Night Special. It was a stunning revelation. Are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. The best is au revoir. More than a quarter century later, the tapes that helped bring down a president can be broadcast for the first time. There's revenge. And a warning to the president. We have a cancer within the close to the presidency that's growing. It's growing daily, and there's no assurance that it will bust, that that won't bust. Tonight, the Nixon tapes, listening in on the White House cover. From ABC News, this is Nightline, reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Most of us who lived through the final days of the Nixon presidency will never forget how it all began. But probably more than half the people alive in America today either weren't born yet or were just too young to have any awareness of what was going on. So let's begin tonight with a thumbnail refresher course. June 1972. The Watergate building here in Washington. Hotel, apartments, and some offices. Among those, the offices of the Democratic National Committee. Several men are arrested after breaking into that office, and they turn out to have ties to both the CIA and the committee to re-elect the president, Richard Nixon. The White House press secretary dismisses the whole affair as a third-rate burglary. It is the beginning of the cover-up. Enough damaging material emerges over the next several months that the U.S. Senate convenes what came to be known as the Watergate hearings. It is at one of those hearings that Minority Counsel Fred Thompson, who would later be elected to the Senate himself, Thompson asks an obscure deputy assistant to the president about a recording system in the White House. Mr. Butterfield, as far as you know, from your own personal knowledge, uh, from 1970 then until the present time, all of the president's conversations and the officers mentioned and on the telephones mentioned were recorded. as far as you know. That's correct, until, until I left. It was a breathtaking revelation. Back in February of 1971, it turned out, President Nixon had ordered his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, to install a voice-activated recording system in his various offices. Haldeman was also instructed to have the phones tapped. And while the quality, as you'll hear shortly, was sometimes terrible, those 3,700 hours of tape conversations shattered the cover-up, led to the conviction of several of the president's closest aides, and ultimately convinced Richard Nixon himself that he had to resign. Among the most damaging tapes were some of those released today. The transcripts have been out before, but unless you went to the National Archives, you will not have heard them before today. This first excerpt in which the president and his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, discuss using the CIA to shut down an FBI investigation of the break-in, this tape convinced many Republicans to abandon Nixon. And five days later, in fact, Mr. Nixon did resign. When Haldeman refers to Walters, incidentally, he's talking about Deputy CIA Director Vernon Walters. Pat Gray was then the acting director of the FBI.
And joining me now, the former White House counsel to President Nixon, John Dean, now an investment banker in California. How did, uh, how did they know to ask about the taping system? Well, they knew because they were actually following up on my testimony before the Senate when I testified that I believed that Richard Nixon had recorded me. And why did you believe that? I believed it because of Nixon's uh, conduct during very late in our dealings. In one of the conversations, a uh, very sensitive conversation, he asked me leading question after leading question. Then at one point he gets up and he goes over to the corner of his office and in a stage whisper he says something to me. And at that point I said, John, this man is recording you. And so I, rather than... You know, I wanted to make the clear to the Senate, I believed there was a record of these. That's why they could test that and test the truth of what I was saying. And I put it in and they kept trying to discredit people, or me, and they finally asked Butterfield and he said, yes, I think Dean was recorded. Now, that piece of tape that we just heard has come to be known as the smoking gun tape. Uh, I need to remind our, our viewers the tape was actually made five or six days after the break-in, wasn't revealed until five days before Mr. Nixon resigned. So there was a two-year gap there. Right. Uh, why do you take issue with that? Why do you think it was not that damning a piece of tape? Well, when you hear the whole conversation, he is actually following my advice. I had been, I was passing on what John Mitchell, the former Attorney General, thought he should do. And in doing so, I was doing it based on my belief that the reason we were concerned at the White House was because of cam potential Campaign Act violations. Contributors were going to be uncovered as a result of the FBI investigation that we were particularly concerned about. This was something that I had an agreement with the Department of Justice several days earlier they would not investigate. But in suggesting that the, the Deputy Director of the CIA call up the Acting Director of the FBI, that's clearly using a, one government agency to block the investigation of another. A week later, it would have been a misuse of an agency. At that time, we were very confused as to what the CIA did know, didn't know, how involved or not involved. We didn't have the answers. And in fact, there is documentary evidence where, uh, uh, that says that they're not even sure at some early stage like that. So I don't think it was an obstruction. It was defensible by Nixon at that well, point. Clearly, there would come a time, as you lawyers like to say, uh, when indeed you no longer felt that things were so innocent. And you made That's a true. warning uh, uh, that contained a, a quote that uh, may be the most famous quote of that time, in which you spoke to the president uh, and said, uh, Mr. President, I think there may be a cancer growing on the presidency. Let's listen to that part. It sounds, John, as, as I hear the president, as though he is really eager to hear, uh, I mean, almost pathetically eager to hear what these terrible things are that are going on. But you then proceeded to tell him what was his reaction as you told him. Yeah, this is a very lengthy conversation. It runs an, over an hour, and I raise one horrible after another. Uh, I'm trying to really reach in and tell him the criminality that I think that he has to deal with at the White House. And every time I'd throw one up, uh, he would bat it away. Uh, it was, if you go on and hear this conversation, you'll hear pauses at time where I'm trying to, I'm really somewhat surprised at the president's reaction. 
and I'm not quite sure how to deal with it next. So I just keep throwing one after another after another. The first time I'd ever gathered all this information in my mind and, and, and tried to tell it to somebody in summary form, thinking it was pretty devastating. And I had hoped the president would, you know, put his hand down on the desk and say, this has got to end. Did you really believe when you went in, when you sort of prepared yourself for this conversation, that you were informing a man who knew nothing about it? And, and uh, what do you think now? Well, I was prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt. That's the way I set up the conversation with him. I now know, uh, having read other transcripts of conversations, that he knew a lot more than I thought. However, I must say, I don't think he knew everything. And he has written himself that I'm the only one who tried to warn him. And as a, as a consequence of those warnings, did he give you any indication that he was going to do anything? Or was it just batting him all aside? It was batting him aside. And as we know from later tapes, he actually went to visit Rosemary Woods when he left me to see if she had some money. Because that's one of the problems that I was raising. That, there, that hush money would be required. That's right. And that, in fact, is going to be one of the things we talk about when we come back. Wiretapping the Democrats and hush money. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Charles Schwab. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you, shareholders, for taking the time to attend... Excuse me. Yes. This is Mr. Uh... Matambo. Looking at your annual report, page 16, can you explain the implications of floating your long-term debt in a potentially inflationary economy? When we created a smarter kind of investment firm... Do you know anything about inventory valuation? We created a smarter kind of investor. My furniture needs can be summed up in one word. Storage. It's color and texture that create an overall design scheme. I've always been drawn to the simplicity of sacred design. Introducing EA Kids by Ethan Allen. I've always believed that form should bow a function. Everyone's at home with Ethan Allen, even kids. It's the comforter, really, that ties the whole room together. There's a sale on now. He's the front runner, and this Sunday he's only on This Week. George W. Bush with Sam and Koki on the last day before the first vote. This week from Iowa, Sunday. No waiting till the end of the year. The biggest sale of the year is Fast Break 2000 now at Capital Chevrolet. Through Monday, get Music City Miracle deals on every new and used vehicle. Make your choice. Pick a 2000 S10 or 2000 Cavalier with 5 speed and air. Only $88 a month. You heard right. Your choice. Just $88 a month and only at Nashville's Capital Chevrolet. And remember, only Capital gives you maximum trade. Maximum choice. Allowance. Hey, it's the Music City Miracle of car deals. That's Fast Break, Fast Break 2000 now at Capital Chevrolet. Before you go out and rent a carpet shampooer, get the Dirt Devil Easy Steamer. The lightest, easiest, most compact carpet cleaner. The Easy Steamer gives you deep cleaning power you can see with a motorized brush that agitates and lifts stains and everyday dirt right out of your carpet, upholstery, or stairs. For professional results at home, get the Easy Steamer because nothing escapes the power of a Dirt Devil. Between January and April 1973, Richard Nixon's popularity drops 14 points. He's a president under siege. Front page stories, especially in the Washington Post, chronicle the allegations against administration officials. On April 12, 1973, the Post reports that former Attorney General John Mitchell, who ran the president's re-election campaign, had allegedly ordered wiretaps against the Democrats. And transcripts of those conversations had been delivered to Mitchell. Two days later, the president discusses the matter with his two top aides, Bob Haldeman and John Ehrlichman. The bugs were to have been placed in three locations. And three places. And Bob, I mean, three places. Watergate, the government headquarters, and the farm. In the conversation, it's a horrible improvement. Uh, now, it involved other things besides tax. And uh, he was not specific. He said, in all, in all honesty, this was a kind of non-decision. No, we felt comfortable with this thing. But we were sort of both those in. I mean, 
Later that night, after attending the White House Correspondents' Dinner, the President calls Chief of Staff Haldeman concerned that the White House plan to pay the Watergate burglars hush money is unraveling. I just don't know how it's going to come out, though. That's the whole point. And I, and I just don't know. Is that when I was serious, when I said to John uh, at the end there, I said, God damn it, all these guys that participated in raising the money and so forth have got to stick to the line that they did not raise this money to obstruct justice. And I'm back once again with John Dean. Um, he sure doesn't sound like an innocent in that in that second conversation. Does no, he? no, he doesn't. Uh, at this point, uh, the cover-up is clearly falling apart. Uh, I have stepped forward. I had told him I was going to go to the prosecutors. I had gone to the prosecutors, and obstruction of justice was quickly becoming the issue. Not we we divided it between pre and post. In other words, pre break in, post break in. And the post problems after the break-in were now becoming the serious problem, which had always troubled me the most. What surprised me a little bit is is how quickly he is prepared to discard his old friend, and he really was his old friend, John Mitchell. Uh, I mean, publicly, Nixon always seemed to agonize about these things. Here, privately, seems easy. Well, um, as the later tapes show, uh, I was the next to go and would become en enemy number one. As uh, the prosecutors once said, I went from good John Dean to mean John Dean. On one level, his instincts are right. Uh, I mean, he just wasn't prepared to go far enough, and that is, let's get this thing out. Let's, let's really burst the canker. That being my belief and my advice to him was that not only did I have to resign, Haldeman and Ehrlichman had to resign, everybody had to go, it was the only way to give him a chance to get out in front of it, and I think if he'd done that, he might have survived. I was going to say very quickly, because eventually, all he, I mean, he dumped every one of you, threw you all overboard. If he'd done it quickly, immediately, would he have saved his presidency? I, I think he could have certainly gone a long way to doing that. Uh, I thought when I started forward, the others would follow me. Uh, I learned just the opposite was the course. Uh, I'd picked a fight now that, rather than find a solution. When we come back, President Nixon summons John Dean and, as John has suggested, asks him to resign. At Earthlink, we believe the Internet can change the way you live, the way you work, the way you learn. Not to mention the way you annoy the heck out of the person in the next cubicle. It's your internet. We just connect you to it. Earthlink and Sprint are internet partners. When I was nine months pregnant, my husband beat me. One night, he came after me with a knife and barely missed our son. I left. My kids and I ended up at a shelter. I realized it wasn't my fault. Women are beaten every day, and if we stayed, I knew he would hurt my daughter. All across the country, battered women and children are starting new lives, thanks in part to Philip Morris, one of the largest supporters of programs that feed, shelter, and counsel victims of domestic violence. But what frightened me most was that if we stayed, I was putting my son at risk of becoming a batterer himself. I grew up in a very loving home, my kids deserve to grow up in one, too. Working to make a difference. The people of Philip Morris. That new boss is from another planet. Totally spaced out at that meeting. Hey, what's that on your desk? ABCnews.com. Ready when you are. I went through a divorce last year, and getting back on my feet has been tough. But the one thing I had to have was a car of my own. I had some credit problems, but I got a yes from 1-800-GET-A-YES. I lost my job a while back, but now I'm working again. I had some hard times, and nobody wanted to give me a break. 
But then I heard about 1-800-GET-A-YES. It's a free call and a free service. And they said yes to me. A day after John Dean informs President Nixon that he's cooperating with federal prosecutors and amid eroding support from congressional Republicans and from inside the White House, Nixon calls John Dean to the Oval Office and asks for his resignation. Nixon wants Dean to sign both a letter of resignation and one requesting a leave of absence. Dean refuses and instead drafts an alternative letter asking for a leave of absence. It was a tense 45-minute conversation where Nixon, perhaps mindful that the conversation was being recorded, reminds Dean of the virtues of truth-telling. Back once again with John Dean. Did it ever occur to you, John, to fall on your sword for the president? Well, actually, Ted, when I started this whole plan of trying to force the issues, I really thought he had multiple opportunities to survive. And I thought it seemed that no one was willing to step forward. And my decision to step forward was not to force the president out of office, but rather give him options where he could survive. So I, did, I in a sense, thought I was, in a way, doing that. And had others have followed, I think he might have, uh, indeed, as I heard, said, survived. But getting back to that original point, if you had not mentioned your suspicion that you were being recorded, the tapes never would have emerged, or probably would not have emerged. And if you had not cooperated with the federal prosecutors, those two things might have changed the course of history. There is no, there is no question in my mind that there was a point where if I had stayed and played, if you will, as opposed to coming forward and breaking rank, that there's no question Richard Nixon would have survived. Uh, I might not have been indicted even, because all there was was hearsay at that point as to above the men who'd been arrested at the, at the Watergate. So who knows what would have happened, but I just wasn't prepared to live my life that way. You, you really became famous for having a steel trap memory. I mean, it turns out that the tapes, in fact, confirmed almost verbatim sometimes what had been said in those conversations. Um, when the president was talking about you got to tell the truth, as he was at the end of that last conversation, what was he about there? Well, was he just being very conscious of the fact that there were microphones all over the place? I think so. The night before is when I had become convinced he was recording me on the 15th. This was on a Monday morning where he was asking for my resignation, and I thought very much that whole conversation, that again, it was filled with leading questions, was really to make a record. And so there was little question in my mind that that indeed is what he was doing. You were a young man at the time. What gave you the spine to say to the President of the United States, no, I'm not, not going to resign? Well, because I thought the, the right thing to do was not just for me to resign, but for those from whom I'd taken my instruction, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, to go to, and that would solve his problem. Explain to me, I mean, people have always put it in terms of why didn't he burn the, the tapes. My question is, why did he leave those microphones in place? Why didn't he just tell the Secret Service, tear them all out? 
Well, he put them back in, actually. Uh, there were there some different ones during Johnson, but he put them back in and turned them on. And I think he wanted a historical record and just never, ever believed that he would have to give it up. But, uh, I mean, even if he'd been able to finish his presidency, can he have really wanted historians, even a hundred years from now, long after his presidency was over, to have listened to those tapes and to have listened to those machinations, manipulations, evasions? Why? Uh, I don't think he ever thought that would happen. In other words, he would preserve what he thought was worthy of preservation, the remainder where he is taking cheap shots at people or attacking women, blacks, Jews, what have you, as he was wont to do, uh, would never have surfaced. So, so I th it was controlled. If he'd, if he'd been able to finish his term, he might have spent his retirement going through 3,700 hours and boiling it down to the essential hundred. He might have had somebody do it for him. John Dean, thank you. Another batch of Nixon tapes will be released early next month. I'll tell you about those in a moment. I want it to be a new way of looking at things. I want it to be larger than life. I want it to be the second industrial revolution. I want it to level the playing field. Nortel Networks is building the new high-performance internet, and the network's businesses need to take advantage of it. So tell us, what do you want Come the internet to be? A cash cow. Right now. Over me. Would you like a bigger washer and dryer? That'd be great. Well, Sears has great deals during their semi-annual home appliance sale. You can save $120 on a Kenmore Super Capacity Plus washer and dryer. Kenmore? Kenmore. I like Kenmore. What's not to like? You'll save on other top name appliances, too. Top names are my favorite kind. Plus, get 0% finance charge till next January when you buy any home appliance, home audio, or video over $399 with your Sears card. So... That clinches it. Get in there. Offer ends Saturday. Saturday on the ABC Big Picture Show. Robin Williams, Nathan Lane, Hank Azaria, and Callista Flockhart. We are when the parents of the bride... Well, who is his father? His father is in the arts. Madonna! Madonna! Meet the parents of the groom. Oh, I could play it straight. It could be a real drag. Come here and give me a hug. Something about the father and Mrs. Coleman. It's nothing. It's a nightmare. <laughs> The Birdcage, ABC Saturday, 8, 7 Central, a great movie every Saturday night. Now hear this. The FDA agrees eating whole grain foods like post shredded wheat as part of a low-fat diet may help you reduce your risk of heart disease and certain cancers. Post shredded wheat. Good for breakfast, even better for your health. Enjoy the taste of quality at Bellmead Cafeteria. Fresh home cooked food at an affordable price has made us a favorite Nashville tradition for more than 35 years. We get started at 6 a.m. preparing a daily variety of fresh salads, vegetables, and delicious entrees. We even have our own in house bakers to prepare a fresh selection of homemade breads and desserts. Honest food at a great value. Come see us today. Bellmead Cafeteria in Bellmead Plaza at the corner of Harding Road and Whitebridge Road. A Nashville tradition for more than 35 years. Another 250 hours of Nixon conversations, what are called the abuse of government power tapes, including that famous 18 and a half minute gap, will be released February 2nd. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. You can talk with John Dean about the Nixon tapes at 4 p.m. Eastern next Tuesday, January 25th. Just click on the Nightline page at abcnews.com. You can order a transcript or video cassette of this or any other Nightline broadcast by dialing 1-800-CALL-ABC. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. Super Bowl Sunday. ABC's got the game and the hottest party in the world. Performances by Tina Turner, Faith Hill, Phil Collins, Christina Aguilera, Tony Braxton, and Enrique Iglesias. Special appearances by Emeril Lagasse and David Blaine. It's the biggest event in television. Super Bowl Sunday, January 30th on ABC.